pleasure to introduce Rahul and Medhika from UNSW. Uh, they are here uh, visiting India for 20, 25 days and they have 20 days and they have had a very hectic schedule uh, presenting previously at ISB and also uh, releasing uh, uh, a book uh, on Indian consumers, a much needed book, I looked it up uh, and it sounds very interesting uh, and they have a chapter in that book. Apart from the book, they also uh, have uh, common and diverse interests and uh, publish very well in the field of marketing. So today they are going to present something which has arisen out of their common interest and uh, Rahul is going to present and Mithika is going to take the questions. So you ask me. She is joking, but she is going to take them. So yeah, thank you so much for yeah coming uh, here and joining us. So, happy to see you. In case you didn't guess, we are a couple of people. Just in case you didn't guess that. Uh, it's like losing the loop. Uh, I've been to Ireland about four, four times now, and uh, first time as an academic, per se, all together. Four, other three times, it was something completely different. So, uh, happy to be here, both of us. Uh, the intention was when we came in there, when we were thinking about coming in there, was to present two papers, uh, one for each of us. I'm a hardcore model, and Nitka is a hardcore consumer behavior. Person and we have uh, relatively little in common as far as market research go, as far as marketing for our papers go. But uh, this is one of those exceptions. So, this is a paper with Vikas. Vikas is the core literature of marketing, and uh, it's been invited for, uh, for the second round of the user term of market research. So, what you will see in here is nowhere close to what we had started off with. It's a very different paper. It started off as a completely important paper, but uh, Got feedback, and uh, again today, what you're going to see today is more of uh, experimental paper than anything else. The one part of it has been relegated to what I call what we call study zero. So I'll talk about that as we well. go uh, Not the best of examples to start off with, but this is just part of the press, so which is why I put this uh, quote in that. It's a it's a quote from the Journal of Association of Consumer Research, which uh, uh, is. As of right now, it's not simply big, but we were discussing this about five minutes back. That's going to be one of the premier journals, at least from what we feel. So this paper came out, not paper actually, an article that came out, I think about two weeks back. And uh, there are a few things in here which are at odds compared to what we find. But I still wanted this because it kind of motivates the entire problem. So start off with the first intense event. Soda sales increase during winters. And that's somewhat counterintuitive. There are a few things that you can kind of uh, call intuitive that uh, ice cream sales might increase during the summer, and you have uh, coffee sales increasing during the winters, but there are lots of products for which there is absolutely no rhyme or reason as to why weather would affect consumption. Yeah. So, in here, Thai sales spike during. It. Clear sky days, again, very, very counterintuitive, but this pattern of weather affecting consumption is something that has been seen very, very often. And we have a few papers in that area. But the latest one that has worked on this is the Lear Job in Modern Science, which is what this paper wanted to be. Uh, ended up being, like I said, something totally different because we did not have the data, not the data, we did not have the expertise in terms of uh, using mobile uh, advertising. But depending upon the weather, the same advertisement results in different conversions as far as sales go. Not just looking at the advertisement, but actually converting. And this is a product which has got no manner of forms or association with weather. So that tobacco varies with uh, weather consumption, which is a little logical. Lottery tickets. When it goes bad, and then you start buying more lottery tickets, you start gambling more. Not just in marketing, but it's, you know, even outside of marketing, especially in finance. There's a lot of literature. There's a famous uh, seminal paper by I think Hirsch Leifer, which says stock returns are explained to approximately three percent by weather. So if I can predict the weather, I can predict what your share price is going to be, which makes me a millionaire, unfortunately, and not. So anyway, lots of things which uh, are 
affected, and I want to bring one of these to your notice, which is probably uh, relatively close to what we are trying to do, is uh, products which are consumed. It's not just a choice problem. Products that are actually consumed are ingested are a function of weather. Now, this is a paper from about 17 years back. It's a German paper. At that point of time, you could publish correlation studies in the world well. Now, this paper, this study would probably not publish, but uh, it's the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is because I'm going to be following up on it as we go. But at the end of the day, that's our uh, sale line. You need to know why weather is affecting consumption. Any kind of consumption, not just food products. So here's a motivation study, and this used to be the central part of uh, an entire study, which is we have the data for the entire United States, but we have just retained data for uh, New York, the state of New York. Primarily because we have way too much of data. Uh, data is analyzed at uh, the census tract level, which is slightly bigger than the log level, but smaller than the supports of what we have as a pin board, so it's something similar. Uh, that's what we use for analysis. So we have data on two products, tobacco and uh, entertainment. Tobacco is data that is readily available in entertainment. We have to jump through a lot of hoops. Entertainment uh, is a lot of things. Entertainment is uh, going to sporting events, going to live theater. So this is a category which is defined by the US Census Bureau. So there's nothing that we do with it. But we have this data. And we had uh, about 80 variables from the census, everything from demographics, and then we had lots of weather, lots of weather-related variables which came into the picture. So demographics came from uh, the, census, the Census Bureau, weather came from lots of other, uh, weatherbug.com, weather.com, so multiple sources. Now, it's very easy to come up with a model if you have this kind of data. We ran a lot of models. We ran a, started off with a plain symbol over this, and uh, found lovely results, weather affecting uh, consumption. But the thing is, at the end of the day, what anybody can come back and tell you is that you have 5,000 data points. You're going to find something no matter what. So we had to take a different route, and this is something which has been following me along ever since I graduated from school. Uh, from a PhD program, it's something known as geographically weighted regression, which allows you to analyze data based on one single geographical region only. So, assume that we are sitting right now in Vastapur. Vastapur has one single data point of the amount of consumption, demographics, and I use those, just one single data point, to come up with a regression. Can't happen. What you do is you start borrowing from regions around you. I'm not going to get into the max of this if anyone who wants to uh, lovely to discuss that. But you get estimates for each and every region that you analyze. So you have a specific estimate for each and every support, each and every postcode, and you can map them as and when needed. The interesting part is this. I'm going to show you the maps that came out of this. In fact, we put them out of uh, paper also. As temperature increases, consumption of entertainment decreases. As temperature increases, the consumption of tobacco decreases. Whereas, if you're looking at precipitation, entertainment expenditure increases, and so does expenditure. How are the two of these related? How is uh, temperature related to precipitation? We did lots of three tests. We found out that, and pretty obvious, that as temperature goes up, the weather is deemed to be nicer. Remember, this is the United States. We are not sitting here. We would rather have colder weather. So, higher temperature is <coughs> better weather. Lesser precipitation means better weather. So the Intuitive finding that you're getting out here, I'm not talking about the top one, I'll talk about that in a second. The intuitive finding that you're getting out here is the fact that as weather becomes better, the consumption of these two products decreases. Why does it happen? We take that into account. 
later. But there's another thing that I want to bring to your attention right now here. We had 80 variables, demographic variables. Nothing was significant in terms of interactive factors at all once in there, which probably led us to let us down this entire field of analysis. It's an interactive factor of gender, which means depending upon what gender you are, you react differently and your consumption is different. How is it different? Just a simple plotting of this tells you women are affected more, but we'll look into it in a lot more detail. So this right now, based on the reviews from the associated data, is what we call a pilot study. It is the motivation study, which allows us to further delve into the actual stories that are going on behind this consumption increasing. Went through the literature, and we found that there were two routes that had been studied. There were two routes that had been studied. The first one is what is known as the thermoregulatory mechanism. What is thermoregulatory? I have something hot to warm myself up when I'm cold. So I'm thermoregulating my body. That's the study which Arthur and Tavasoli looked at when I was talking about. The second one is a cognitive mechanism. Relatively little done in this, but this in by Chima and Patrick recently in Jema again. It says, depending upon the weather around us, our brains slow down or speed up. And depending upon that, our consumption patterns change. The third one, which is the one that we are focusing on, we have looked at both of those, and we have results for taking care of both of those mechanisms. I'm not going to talk about both of them just talk about one. The last one is the one that is our focus because no studies have been done that yet. What is that mechanism? That is the affective mechanism. Again, that's the bigger special speciality. She works in that area mode. So something happens to my mood because of the weather, which leads to the changes in the <coughs> consumption. What is it? There's a lot of literature in medicine, there's a lot of literature in marketing that I'm going to talk about as you go along. But this is the basic fact that we are looking at. Uh, weather, weather has multiple components, we look at that as we go along. Makes you sad or happy, which is the affective component, and that leads to changes in consumption. This is a plain, simple uh, mediation model. There isn't much that's going on in here. There is a certain component that's left over after the mediation, which is after taking care of the affective route, is there any remaining effect of whether or consumption? Now, if all those three theories that we had talked about earlier, if they were true, then they would have a remnant effect. If they aren't, then they would have no remaining effect. This would be the only mechanism that would work. So start off as this. And at any point of time, if you have any questions, just feel free to A very simple way of looking at this relationship is that temperature increases. It's a good day. I don't want to go to a close place, like a theater or whatever. Uh, so I, I can be outside. Uh, uh, is it partly related? It is partly related to the mood, but it is straightforward convenience. So this uh, is one of the first questions that came up in the review process, and the easiest answer is there are no answers. The easiest answer is we have a look. We have a look at products which do not have an outside component, so an outdoor component. So let's suppose we are looking at uh, going out of the theater. So that has a certain component which makes me want to go outside and feel the weather. Now, if I'm looking at drinking coffee sitting out in the comforts of my home, mm -hmm. there is no external component related. So, so the category of entertainment does not include going to a theater, is it? It does. It, it does. does. So in the first study that we showed you, that is a valid concern. So as you go along, we are going to get rid of all of those concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, another way of, we've already done this, I'm probably not going to show it to you in here because I don't uh, have that kind of space that I can uh, devote to that, but we are also controlling for time spent outdoors. Mm -hmm. So that's also something that we are controlling for. So products that have an outdoor components, products that don't, 
how much time you have spent indoors versus how much time you have spent outdoors. So all of those are controlled. So the effect stays in spite of controlling for all those. So going for entertainment is a, is a continuous variable or is it's the amount of money spent. Now, so it's the amount of money spent. It's the yeah, so money this spent. is a very uh, aggregated secondary data so that we got. But then we have a series of experiments to rule out each of these explanations. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Can you share the line of thought for that cognitive explanation? What exactly the, is the, the cognitive explanation? You spend a lot of calories keeping yourself warm. So when you spend a lot of calories keeping yourself warm, relatively little calories can be devoted to your cognitive processes. So there is a trade-off that's happening. Or if it's too hot, then you spend yourself spend calories keeping yourself cool, and less effort can be. Devoted to your cognition. Thermal regulation, expending calories on maintaining your body. So, how are they different? So, thermal regulation is you are taking something external to maintaining or maintaining your body temperature. The cognitive element says that you are using too many calories to keep your body warm or cold and less close to you. So, that's the basic thing behind the chima and that. But team and pandemic don't establish that. They don't establish what, what that. What they look at is that small variances in temperature and they did this indoor completely, right? So let's say your home office temperature is set at 60 degrees Fahrenheit versus 62. They said there's an optimal range and when temperature goes up or down from that, people um, are able to process information more or less. So they showed the downstream process sort of and the explanation was through information processing. So they said, okay, the performance of, let's say, a cognitive task goes up or down because of differential levels of information processing. The biological perspective might be the calorie one, but they don't really so establish it. So that optimal range would decrease cognitive function? Yes, exactly. But, but again, that's just a conjecture. They have not even See, tried to prove that. Potentially, they can be non-linear. Yes. yes. Having said that, in all of our data, we did not find one single place where there was non linear. That's that was really strange because we were also expecting it. But the logical reasoning behind that might be that we don't go above 90. There's very little data that we have about 90, which translates to roughly 30, 30, 30, 30 degrees. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. So we don't have data about that. No matter. It's not that we don't have data about that. Yeah, very little data about that. That's not enough to But the linear, the linear relationship is very, very strong. So going back to this, so what we are going to talk about, uh, we started off talking about uh, established in literature was the weather to affect relationship. That has been studied, again, not just in Martin, but outside of Martin as well. In fact, there's a very little that has been done in Martin, which is primarily more of conjecture. And the second one, which is, Given that you are in a certain mood, you consume to fix that mood, to repair that mood. That's something which has been looked at now. So those are the two parts that we will look at. That's the first, where that's primarily from outside of marketing. Um, you find that as weather gets worse, you tend to feel sad. That's the gist of the entire process. Your mood goes down. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, segue in here, which is which moods are we talking about? And it depends upon the literature that you're looking at. Medicine just looks at sadness, because once you come out of medicine, they start looking at happiness. And that's a bad interest. So the measure that we used was. It's different across different studies, but the primary measure that we use was a NAS scale, which has been around since forever. So we use that, which allows us to look at both the positive as well as the negative scales. And uh, although the final study reports a composite, if we look at just the positives and the negatives, the patterns are very similar to what our results are. So higher temperatures, positive affect, extreme temperatures, restore thermodynamic balance. Basically, at the end of the day, you are looking at that. We also interact with temperature. 
precipitation with temperature? We did uh, in the um, study zero. We found an interactive effect. The problem, however, with that is that for extreme highs, we do not have data on precipitation. So that particular box is completely missing. So we analyzed that data set to depth. Uh, there is an interactive effect. It was significant at E equal to 0.05, not at E equal to 0.01. Given that there were 5,000 data points, that's not something you want to touch on this thing. That's fine now. But it's once again intuitively. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If it's cold and it's snowing, I have a lot of data. Hot and rain, just so that box has kind of been missing. Second, and this is a brand monsoon territory. We must say it's a consumption and mood. Something happens to your mood, you do your level best to try and fix it, repair it. So if your mood is bad, you as you go through a higher degree of consumption. And there's something I want you to bring to your attention in here, which although we go way beyond it, but this is where the reviewers wanted us to focus upon. Hedonic, <coughs> gambling, alcohol, and tobacco, all of them being economic. So the studies have been with respect to hedonic products. Uh, do we see patterns with respect to non hedonic products? The answer is we do. Uh, and the pattern is completely reversed, but it's not a part of the study because the AE wants us to focus on just hedonic products, so that's why I'm just going to show you that. And if he wants to, I can. Uh, data on the non products. The general angle came in just because of exploratory data research. It was not a part of the original study, but we found that interactive effect. Went back and had a look at literature. There was a reason for us to consider males and females at a different point. Men affected less by weather, temperature as well as precipitation. Women affected a lot more. Plus, that's where we come to uh, marketing. To fix your mood, women get involved in consumption a lot more as compared to So we are looking at, like, you call it double whammy in here, which is the weather affects women more, and because of that change in affect, women consume more as compared to men. That's not to say men don't. Men also show the same pattern, it's just the pattern is higher, a lot more higher for women, which we'll talk about. And so are they controlling for age? We also have age, yes. All of this is having control for all demographic factors. And the key expenditures are individual specific or household? Which ones? The consumption expenditures. Yeah. Those are the ones that I showed you in the first one were household specific, but they were all controlled for size of household. So Hispanic households, for example, are average of 5.5. The data that you're using is individual. Yes. In the experiments, yes. In the experiments, it's individual. The studies here that I showed you was household, adjusted for household size. You have measured emotions for effective states. Ah. So which scale would you have used? Finance. So we use finance. Uh, but not pet, uh, pleasure, or something, or not the No, we didn't. Uh, but even in Banas, like I said, if you take out the positives and the negatives and run these separately, the results are So it's not that it holds only for the composite measure, it holds for both the measures. Uh, why did we not use PAT? PAT is a, another theoretical framework that you can use to look at emotions, but you use it more when you're trying to distinguish between emotional states or mood states which differ in arousal. So that's the Merabian and Russell and they're saying, so for example, anger is a high arousal emotion, even if it's negative and sadness is a low arousal emotion. That was not our main um, theoretical framework here. What we were saying is, and what theory has shown is, that it's more the positive and negative aspects. So we weren't getting into discrete emotion states, or mood states. We were looking at more the generic, the generalized negative positive state. And for that, a simple finesse was sufficient. So you are not considered a dominance part? No. 
because again arousal is more the physiological manifestations of each emotion right so i can take a functionalist approach to emotions where i say that emotions trigger certain both states right and motivations and that's that's another fridge diet or all that that whole sort of uh, literature i can take a physiological approach which looks at arousal and dominance sort of distinction across emotion states this is more the appraisal and and not not even the cognitive appraisal the very basic sort of pleasantness versus unpleasantness of an emotion and that's what we are using okay so what is the reasoning behind the difference between the males and the females there is your physiological mechanism there is your neurological mechanism um, you're not getting to any that because that involves measurements that are expensive and time consuming so we steal from that to see that there are differences and literature tells me that there are differences and as a marker that's not my focal interest my focal interest is what can I do with this as a marker how can I at the end of the day sell more so propositions increase in negative weather consumption will lead to an increase in hedonic consumption again we're focusing just on hedonic there was a flip which said increase will lead to an increase a decrease in hedonic and non-hedonic consumption that's been scrapped, uh, will be mediated by an affect, this entire weather consumption relationship, and finally, the mediating effect will be different for males and females. So that's our three set of propositions. Uh, they are not a part of the paper, but that's where it's going. Okay. Those three explanations, the regulation, cognitive, and effect, why do you consider them independent? It might happen that they might be independent. Um, effect is the underlying thing. Because of thermoregulation, you are in a bad mood because of non-optimum temperature. That leads to an uncomfortable uh, emotional state and because of which you are not able to exert cognitive resources. So multiple, multiple answers to that question. The easiest one is that we have taken a product, for example, which has no uh, thermoregulatory properties. So if I can show this pattern, even in a non thermoregulating product, <coughs> the thermoregulating path is ruled out in that particular case. Now, second answer is, in spite of the thermoregulating, the affective path, you have another remnant of the affective, of the thermoregulating part left over, which tells you those are two separate patterns. Now, are they interacting? Certainly possible. But they are still two distinct patterns because in spite of controlling for one completely, I still have a remnant. I'm not showing this in here, but that's a second explanation of that you do have. That no point of time do we say that these are you know not related, but these are coexisting. We are not uh, making any assumptions on the category, you have just said hedonic consumption. This uh, we are expecting that this will hold for uh, we found it for a lot of things. We are going to look at multiple categories as we go along. It might happen that it holds only for some category which is important to the consumer. So it was like uh, we had a total of 12 product categories and uh, one non one uh, non thermal regulatory product and the factor goes <coughs> for each and every one of those. And we obviously can uh, check for any pre-existing preferences for any of the products across genders, so just in case the base levels were different across the genders. All of those genders. The other thing is that because of the experimental design and manipulation that we implemented finally, where we not only measured, so you'll see the studies, we, we manipulated more different ways, we measured more, we forecasted more uh, weather, sorry, and um, so all of those explanations of individual level differences such as, you know, their preferences, whether or not they're allergic to certain products, although we do consume, you know, control for that in consumables, and things like that are going. Because if you have an interactive effect, then obviously random individual differences are explained away. So we do still find it consistent, right? And going back to the earlier question about the in interactive nature of these mechanisms, that is very much possible, but our direct effect captures whatever the remnant effect that we see, and we see that in every single study. So affect is the largest explanation by far, because I think it explains what... Uh, it's what not it true is. for all products. Ice cream, for example, affect is not the largest. Right. So as you would expect, there's a larger thermoregulatory probably explanation for ice cream, because you would probably want to consume it in winters, even though it is a non-hedonic product. 
So there is an effect, but less so. But yes, you're right. We don't tease apart the whether or not there are uh, interactive it's effects right. of. We try and address the fact that yes, regardless of these three mechanisms that exist, affect is one of the viable options or mechanisms to explain hedonic consumption across categories. So for the third proposition, you are looking at the moderating role of <coughs> gender on path A and B both? Okay. Uh, we did a moderated variation first, and uh, results are absolutely perfect, fine, but moderated variation is a dominated model. So what we did instead was run two separate variations for across the genders, across the genders, and then compared the paths. The coefficients and the standard deviations allowed us to compare the paths and we looked at the differences across those. A moderate deviation is simple to do. We did that, and that was obviously very, very you know, in uh, agreement with what we were saying. But it's a lesser one, just, just that. So it, it is the moderating effect of gender, but we are not running a moderate deviation. On both the paths. On both the paths, actually, on all three paths. Also, the remnant path. Which is, was my next question, sir, which means that. If you're looking, if you find, as you find a full variation in P2, then full variation in P2, mm -hmm. P2, then how do you compare the P3 for females and males? The direct effect, which was both are insignificant. Right? No, no, no. So both are significant. So what we're doing is we are splitting the data by males and females by gender. And both show full variation. Both show full variation. Now this is uh, this is not your uh, standard so bad just mediation. This is your uh, process, process, model. process models, yeah, actually internet models. So it's completely different. So now once you're done, you might have a remnant effect also. So it might not be a complete mediation. Full or partial, then it's fine. Yes. <coughs> but if both give full, can you compare the non-significant coefficient of part C in the final model? No, obviously. Not. So if part C is not significant, which is what we found in lots of products. Then there is no use of comparing those because both of them are not seen. Part C in the presence of part A and B. Part C? So, direct effect in presence of part A? No. So, part A is completely different. So, basically, the total effect, which is C, is equal to A times B plus C. So, A and B were significant each and every time. C, on the other hand, was significant sometimes and was not significant other times. For thermoregulated products, we found C to be significant. And whenever it was significant for one, it was always significant for the other. And at that point of time, you could compare those. <coughs> uh, I think the only product category where both of them were significant and the remaining effect was not significant was uh, beer. So there was no, you know, I think it was beer, where between males and females, the remaining effect was significant but not significant. But A and B were significant every single time, and they were different across genders. Good for that. I do not understand that point where you said uh, double mediation, separate mediation for both of them is better than moderated mediation. Yes, because of the fact that it's a, uh, it's a statistical thing. So think about it this way: you have uh, you're running you're running a dummy variable regression. So it's it's exactly the same, but you know the logic's exactly the same. So you have a uh, slope for uh, males and you have a slope for females. When you run a dummy variable regression, the slope of both of these are the same. Which means both of them are affected to the same extent. The only thing that's different is the intercept. Now if I split it into males and females, what am I doing? Two separate regressions. So one of them, both of them have separate betas, separate slopes. Which means I'm not saying males are the same as females in terms of their effect. That's why it's a better method of expression. <coughs> it's actually one paper by you that's done that, right? Yes. So there are multiple instances of showing that uh, the second method is better than the first. So but again, it doesn't make difference what method you use the results. I mean, it's also theoretically, if you look at the model, moderated mediation would imply that this, this moderator of gender is coming in at one path. Process model or the indirect model, there wouldn't be anything that would show it both ways, the double whammy that we are predicting. So we are saying gender has a 
differential effect on both path A and path B, right? But if I run a standard process model, that would only account for path A and path C, right? That's where moderated mediation will come. Path B is supposed to be independent. There is no model as far as I'm aware which will control for the same moderator coming in at two places. So I'll have to run two separate models anyway, one where the moderator comes in at path A and path C and another where the moderator comes in at path B and path C to accomplish a more nuanced and cleaner analysis. What we do is we show that yes, overall the mediation holds because we are not predicting contrasting or competing effects of gender, right? Both males and females move in the same direction, it's only that females move more. So we show an overall mediation with the data and then we split it, right? And the split allows us to compare all the parts across the genders. The role model, which uh, single variable moderating both your A and the uh, 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 and B, or uh, then it, that would have been uh, okay for this one. No, I no, don't think the mathematics are it not. Still not be all right because then you are constraining two slopes across the genders to be the same. The only difference that you have is the interactive. So it's not going to give you the same results. Actually, I think there is a process model which does that. No? As far as I know, so 15 models that process has, does it have anything that allows the same models? So what you're saying is that this one allows both the intercept and the beta the intercept to be as well as the beta to vary. Now we're talking about five parameters instead of three. More parameters that you must No, I'm sorry. Nine parameters So obviously that becomes better. I can walk it through. There's a lot of you know literature that has done that. It's a lot easier to run a moderate mediation, which is where it comes from. So that's what's Okay. So it's a series of four studies I've walked through these. This is a little too much. Um, that we had in the paper before it went out for its first review. We add a little to it and I'll take you through that as we go along. Again, it's talking every time. So, study one, last study, large Southern US University. Uh, pre tested four conditions in terms of what is good weather and what is bad weather. Uh, we found Martin Sunny to be the most light, <coughs> snowy to be the least light. And, and that order, in some order, but that's what it was. And uh, 200 students, the balanced sample, which is the problem that we will have later to talk about. Weather planning is based on the Gurdon and Katna. All that it says is tell us about the weather outside, uh, how you feel, something that you've done, some memory that you have that comes up because of this kind of weather. So all that it's doing is bringing that weather to, into savings. It's not really about that, they're just trying to go with that. Food preferences, like I said, we had a total of 16 or, it's either 16 or 18 products, one of those, only two of which I'm going to show you. Uh, that's a seven point scale, how much do you feel like having that product right now? And then uh, your dependent is, your ergonomic food consumption preferences, all the manipulation checks are in Lots of control variables, I think we had, we finally ended up with seven control variables, of which we retained only Two, uh, the important one that was retained was the time spent outside. That makes a difference. It is a significant COVID. Uh, those are the stats. I'm going to focus more on the graph because that makes a lot more sense. So the two products that we are showing are cookies and uh, chocolate. In the new version, they've actually been merged, but I'm retaining this. So let me explain what the stands for. So this is your total effect of weather or consumption, of which the black part is the direct effect of weather on Africa. That's your part A. Gray one is the direct effect of Africa on consumption, which is your part B. And this thing, gray on top, is the remaining effect. So for chocolates and cookies, the remaining effect was not significant. What was significant was part A, which is the black for males and the black for females. That's significantly different at B less than 0.01. Also, the effect of. Is that beta values on the. Those are beta values. 
it's not a very statistically correct method because one of these is negative and one of these is positive, but it shows the absolute amount. And it's a very good illustration which gets the point across. So you see that there is a difference across uh, whether or not, but the effect of affect on consumption is a higher difference. And that's true for both the products. Is there mediation? Yes, there is mediation. Uh, mediation was present at 95 and also at 99, but 95 is what we import, so that's what uh, counts. Mediating effect is significant, as well as the individual effects, they are significant. So that's study one, done in the confines of the lab, obviously. And poke holes in that, so we do a nationwide study across the United States. So, those points that you see, that's where we had the exponents from. Uh, 358 a pattern of a lot more females answering as compared to males is something that we ran into multiple times. So, we were asked by the WTO team to find some solution to this. So, what we did was we did a bootstrapping approach where instead of looking at the entire 298 females, we made the female sample compatible with 60 respondents and we did a bootstrapping and every single time we found uh, analysis to hold. So what are we doing? Now we are not asking, now we are not primary people. We know where they responded from. We have their zip code addresses, we have their zip codes and we have their IP addresses. Using those, given the time that they answered the survey, we have the time. What was the weather like in terms of temperature, in terms of precipitation, we have those records. Put those in. Uh, food preferences, same two products, and a seven point scale. And we got the same results. In the first case, those betas might not look significant, but believe me, they are. Significant at even one to one. But look at the difference that we are getting in temperature. Temperature makes a huge difference. In the previous case, we just had weather. Now we are splitting that into temperature as well as precipitation. We have an effect of precipitation. It's still more for females as compared to males. We have an effect of affect consumption, but we have a huge effect. This model is simply because your precipitation variable has a lower number of the <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's <coughs> Somebody came back and said your products might have thermal regulatory problems because at the end of the day it's a warm, soft cookie. It makes you feel nice and gooey inside. So is there a thermal regulatory product, a property to this product that's leading to this happening? The answer was relatively simple. It shows a product which has no thermal regulatory properties whatsoever. What is the product? The product is actually a choice. Once you complete this survey, what you can do is choose what lottery you want to be entered in. So we have a $50 lottery. This is pre tested. A $50 lottery with a gasoline card, which is as utilitarian, as non uh, hydraulic as you can get, all the way to a good Iowa luxury. Now, the question always comes in is this more than that? We did our t test and we did find that good Iowa chocolates were considered to be a lot more hydraulic. You know, it's not calculated, it's good Iowa, so it's as unhealthy as you can get. Again, we had a similar problem with the ends. We did the same thing. The second step is fourth study. 25 respondents. This is again a big southern university. So no matter what you do, the results are really, really strong. You get the same set of results every single time. So, this is where we had stopped in our first uh, iteration of the paper. We found that studies three and four were effectively telling us that the effect was consistent no matter what you tried. But uh, the chairman comes back and says, but can a manager use this? And here was the uh, suggestion. Let's look at what happens 
when instead of showing instantaneous weather, when instead of bringing that instantaneous weather salience into mind, we talk about a long-term view. So what happens when you talk about not the weather right now, but the weather forecast, what's going to happen over the next five days? So that was the second for the new study that's part of that. Missed something, but uh, what, uh, by giving those four, four options, what were we checking? We were checking what people chose. So you can be entered into one of those four categories. Now, if I choose a utilitarian product, that's A. Now, under hot conditions, under warm conditions, good weather, people tended to choose that one. Under bad weather conditions, they tended to choose in that order. So it's an ordinal level. It's ordinal. And we didn't reason that also put all the city as you put that. Um, right. So we have now uh, the two dollar propositions and everything. And came down to this was uh, as you can see this is somebody something that somebody has already talked about. It might not be feasible for about to get uh, executives to respond to monetary to Monitoring weather changes, which is instantaneous weather, but they can come up with strategic insights. And when we started looking at this, there's so much that's been done in what we call pop literature. It's not that's been done. And even in the industry. And, uh, this was, again, I had no idea that this was happening. But banking, and there's a whole company behind it. Weather effects, which uses the ad that you see on your phone to give you the right type of advertisement. So, depending on what the weather forecast is like, I either show you a pantheon advertisement or I show you some other advertisement. But if I show you a pantheon advertisement, depending on the weather conditions, there's an increase of 28%. That's as much money as you. About as far as my general operation goes, we will find out if that works. So, last time uh, we actually have two more about those. 187 respondents across the entire United States, 65 males, 63 females, half of which saw that, the other half saw that. Truthfully, I had no hopes of this working because you're talking about just days of weather forecast, who thinks that much in the future? And uh, just, it was completely not intuitive. So it was just a two cell design, frankly speaking, we ran that. The results were not just good, they were beyond excellent compared to what we were expecting. It shows you that whatever Pantene was doing, they had hardly thought through it. And the practitioners are doing a better job than we are. We can easily show that it works. And not just for the, again, we had chocolates, bikis, and we had gift cards. It holds for my own. Which weather did you send this survey? Which weather did you send it? It actually varied because there are two cities. No, actually, this was, this was not two cities. This is, uh, this is all the, across the US. All across the United States, so it's in that city. Which part of, which time of the year? So it was during winter, but it also went out to people who were who experiencing higher temperatures. Not just low temperatures, but it was done. Uh, January. January. But it's done. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, it's a more conservative test of our effects because we are showing that even though your weather right now is bad, bad. this was also in response to the JMR review team, which said that you know we want you to manipulate weather in a different way rather than a very overt priming where you're saying, oh, think about a certain weather condition, hot and sunny, and then what do you do on those days, and how you know what kind of activities you participate in, because that makes it very salient, right? Oh, it's sunny, I go sit on the beach, or I go outside for a walk. They said, try something different, and the Lee et al. marketing science paper uses weather forecast, though not the way we've done it. So it's, it's more like a correlational thing. So we said, okay, we'll manipulate weather using weather forecast, but a different manipulation. And so regardless of your location, and I don't know if we controlled for that in the analysis, the actual weather. I have the weather. Thing. And uh, in terms of what the actual answer, the maximum temperature of the response that were here was somewhere in the 80s. The 
min was less than zero for that. So it's a relatively high range. Uh, to answer that question, because that still leaves uh, a little bit of uh, uh, thing up in the air, we actually ran this across controlled cities. We also have that data. So controlled cities, so there were three that were relatively hot and three that were freezing cold. Okay. That's not in here. And same thing. It doesn't really make too much of a difference. Now, in that case, we only showed forecasts for uh, cold to the cold cities that are hot to the hot cities. So that's what makes logical sense. In this case, it's possible <coughs> that people who were in hotter regions saw cold forecast and vice versa. So that might lead to a little bit of cognitive dissonance, <coughs> but, which is why we did the other study also. That's a very good one. So. Okay, so there's your uh, mandatory research contribution slide, which is tested your uh, effect across foods and non-foods, getting a double value thing for females, no matter what. They go through a wide range of uh, methodologies, which is what uh, you should aim for. You should be saying that that's what you should aim for. He established at least partially the, the, the underpinnings of the situation check, and we have the conclusions for our managers. What is the public policy? Uh, <laughs> those are French, frankly speaking, but as of right now, the intention we are not going to put that in the paper, which is if you make people, and this is a paper by Andre, which tells you that if you make the consumers aware of the fact that they are indulging in hedonic consumption, then they actually bring down their consumption. So if you are engaged in alcohol consumption and uh, a respondent is uh, made aware of that fact, so that effect is yes. Right, so basically the affect literature shows that once you make the affect effect salient, they go away or you label affect, right? Mm -hmm. So these only work because people don't realize that they're actually behaving in that manner. So I do have that in my affect consumption papers as well, and I think it is a real policy implication that if you know that bad weather will induce overconsumption, whether it's a food or a vice products like alcohol and tobacco, you can have campaigns warning people and urging them to be moderate. Whether it's, you know, oh yes, that, that pastry seems really tempting right now, but please be aware, whatever. whatever. It's sunny, it's not going to be so tempting. Right, so, so you know, so there, there are policy implications as well as marketing implications in terms of it. But just on that same question, would not the research kind of support the stereotype that women are emotional and they are more susceptible to yes. emotions and, yes, uh, and in a way support and kind of contribute is a bad word but that discrimination no, but is how you and, and that's, that's very interesting right so there's a lot of research traditionally 25 years ago yes we would say emotions are irrational right so you're coming from that perspective that emotions are really rational and therefore being emotional <laughs> is, a, is a bad thing. Yes, women are biologically more susceptible to emotions and they respond. But what recent research has shown is that emotions are actually your precognitive sort of shortcuts and they have developed over hundreds and thousands of years to give us an advantage. And sometimes, and this has been shown across categories, very interesting studies in stock markets even. So the intuitive stock market people, which is more times women, perform better than their male counterparts, which seems very counterintuitive because finances, most of us assume, is the forte of men, right? So there's a lot of... No, it won't be. Because emotions, the, the literature has made this leap now more than, let's say, 20 years ago, that emotions gave us an edge. Yes, sometimes this is a shortcut, you go wrong, right? And you, you're not dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's, so you could make a mistake. But what it also does is it makes you competitively more advantageous, right? So it gives you the edge to make decisions very, very fast. And those decisions are not irrational, actually. So, Michelle Farm, he's at Columbia, he's actually done that effect as a decision making and he's talked about it. He has quite a nice couple of papers on this. So, yes, we are emotional, but we actually have an edge because no, of that. No, no, no. <laughs> Supporting the stereotype. No, no, no. It's supporting the stereotype. But the thing is, the stereotype was stereotype because it was perceived as a bad thing. And it was think, oh, it's emotional. You're just crying. It's not cognitive. It's not rational. But that's what I'm trying to say. The research has now shown that being emotional is actually not irrational. 
So it basically depends on what side of that line you are on. So you can decide whether you want the questions to be good or bad. <laughs> There are a couple of papers in JCR, one of them by Hawkins and Dada, I don't remember, yeah. where they talk about how weather or even ambient temperature influences choice of romantic movies and uh, hot or cold products and they say hot immediately no. <coughs> romantic, movies romantic movies, I think that is Hong and Soon 2012, if I'm not wrong. Uh, they, yeah, they run experiments but they also have some similar data where you look at weather forecast and they tie up with blockbuster. Hong and Su. Uh, I'll look up and send another paper. But yeah, so th that and movie. And you get loneliness as the mediator. No, just saying that there's some literature. Uh, right, but uh, I, yeah, and that's an interesting category because I think you find very strong effect, general yes. effects there, right? Yes. So yes. romantic comedy or romantic movies, women yeah. might perceive that as hedonic, men might perceive that as negative hedonic, right? Yeah. So they'll be like, I don't want to watch it or maybe watch it, right? So I'm not sure, yeah, they talk, I don't know if they talk about gender effect, but they say, yeah, whether how you, whether you feel lonely or not directly then influences romantic versus a lot of choice of romance. There's a huge quote in here, which is the uh, festival season. I think that is going to create a huge oh, the Christmas. problem. Christmas. Yeah, Christmas increases the low I think so. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I think so. It's definitely a good time. So there are a couple of papers in JCM which talk about, uh, yeah, you, like you said, hot and cold products. That's not going to work. That would be thermoregulatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's the other one would be Again, did they, the hot and cold products I talked about, in the best of my recollection, they did not have was it JCR? Yes, yes. Both, I think, in oh, JCR yeah. and they were experiments. As far as I Let me, like, I'll look up the paper and send it. There's one in Journal of Advertising. Well, I don't but that is response to advertising. That's yes, I think we, we have that. Yeah. We have okay. a lot of those. Same, same. That would be interesting to see. I'm uh, very, very, I didn't have a look. So, how did you distinguish between learning food products? So this, these products were selected from uh, prior literature as well. So I have worked in this one single study, this obviously with the U.S. population, where certain products like chocolate and cookies emerge as universally hedonic or perceived as universally more hedonic than certain other products like oatmeal bars and raisins. But across each study, we also have measures of hedonicity for the products. So individual data level, we have okay, how we don't really perceive this product to be. So we maintain that and we do find consistent findings in terms of uh, people on aggregate rating perceived it on the product as well. Do you mean to say that there are uh, food products which is weather agnostic? Yes. In terms of the perceived anonymity, at least that's Just what in we terms of perceived anonymity. At least that's what we found. Now, what we are not getting into is what is the difference, right? So somebody can argue, well, chocolates are seven on a ten-point scale in location X, but a nine out of ten. But for our purposes, it doesn't matter because what we are comparing is the difference of the difference. So one is across genders and one is across location and both of those differences are significant. So if chocolate is seven in one location, then oatmeal bar might be a two, and chocolate is nine, then oatmeal bar might be a three or four, but regardless, because it's not even an inter-product, we, we uh, get the effects. But you're right, those differences might hold, but those differences do not impact our uh, results because it's a difference of the difference. Is it uh, because of what it is consumed with I mean, did you clarify on that? I mean, how do we consume cookies? Uh, is it because we consume that with coffee? Or say with cold coffee? US is not that specific. So that might be India specific and that is definitely an interesting point which is generally with mood research as well but also with mood and consumption research, right? So it's a very much a uh, western mentality or psychology that you're feeling sad, you open a tub of ice cream and it's in popular media as well and you start dipping. Growing up, I didn't have those kinds of, you know, um, affective motivations or goal states. So it would be interesting to at some point study whether affective consumption relationships hold universally across cultures. I very much doubt they do. Mm -hmm. 
affective expressiveness also differs. So you might find that these effects either go away or reduce drastically across populations. <coughs> then also Professor Basson's point, right, the linearity or the inverted U or U-shaped curve would probably come up, right? In a place like Ahmedabad, 48 degrees is not pleasant, right? <laughs> so there's no way you can make me believe that it's hot and sunny and it's pleasant. But again, it's, it's restricted to a specific location and the variability across the continental US is not enough to get into those extremes. So um, yes, those are all issues, but because of the interactive nature of our effects as well as the uh, nuanced mediation, those are not enough to jeopardize them. So does the partnership status change the relationship? It does change your affective <coughs> affective state in general and that's a separate oh. line of research which has shown that that your marital status makes a difference. Makes a difference. But so that is one because that will get captured in your measure of effectiveness. No, we actually have a gender measure. We have a gender measure, we have a marriage we have a marital status measure also. That's the second uh, period. Yes, in the second period. But uh, there was nothing there was no you might we feel like having a tub of ice cream, mm -hmm. but you may not do that depending on where yeah. you are and how, so the actual consumption may differ yeah. depending Absolutely. on the area. So, that, uh, Most of this <coughs> research is like located in the US. It's been very interesting to do the same thing in India. In India, India again. Imagine you, you, you drink chai irrespective, even if it's hot, you have to drink chai. So, the first time we saw uh, Bridget Jones' diary, Bridget Jones' diary has this uh, about just coming up with a, a whole uh, ice cream it's called a spatula or something and going straight in. That's not something we can envision. <coughs> also right emotional now. expressiveness, right? Or how you respond to emotions. So think of Japanese people, right? Yeah, so very emotion. much learn to control their emotional response mm -hmm. in public or even private, right? They might be feeling angry, same face, happy, same face, and I might be stereotyping here <laughs> a little bit. But the point is that Western media or Western culture might allow you to be emotionally expressive or being more emotionally expressive at least in terms of consumption, mm -hmm. which is not the same understanding. So that is a separate line of research which I want to at some point get into, which is the affect is not the same culturally right. and it is not experienced and responded to in the same manner culturally. Right. The consumption decisions are more individual there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Even within a household. Which is not the case in India, right? So you are diabetic or you are old and your wife will be after you, right? Why are you eating that but we leave it now? <laughs> Check the effect of the spouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, we, we see some of these, uh, I mean, when, when we are in a particular mood, we want to increase the consumption of certain items. If we are sad, we want to increase it. If we are happy also, we want to increase. So we actually uh, found that for... Uh, uh, no. No, uh, there is another... For open body clients. Oatmeal repairs your mood. So oatmeal is a uh, uh, positive product. What's the word? Red grapes. Is. Red grapes. So another research. That's not red grapes. So I looked it's also something we have. I tested several products. And red grapes was one of those products that for American uh, students at that time was both a tonic and a healthy product. So obviously that was not used because that, was, that would not allow us to because that's not part of this research. That's why we selected only products which, will, uh, which are dominantly either hedonic or... No, we, we, we are reporting only those ones. We looked across the top and all of them hold. It's not that you know, there's even one product that's out of place. All of them hold. It's just that there's too much story to tell. So you start talking about the effects <coughs> that... You know, those are the big completely. According to the Meravin and Russian model, they say that it happens simultaneously. There is a stimulus, there is an organism, and then there is a behavior, affective, cognitive, and cognitive. So, how do you handle that part, like the cognitive part of the of your sample? Like, <coughs> it doesn't matter for our explanation. Yes. Okay. Now, there are even in appraisal literature which I was mentioning briefly, emotions have six appraisals, right? So pleasantness is one dimension, which is what we are distinguishing emotions on. But there are other dimensions such as certainty, control, 
and depending on the downstream variables, one or more might come into play. So in some of my research where I've looked at discrete emotions such as say comparing sadness with happy, uh, sadness with anger or fear, I've looked at things other than pleasantness, right, to differentiate those or pride from gratitude, I've looked at other dimensions. And those appraisals, those cognitive appraisals, both proceed and arise from emotional state. So imagine you are in a fearful situation. Why are you in a fearful situation? Because you had some cognitive appraisal, oh, there's a snake. This is, I don't know what's going to happen. I could be harmed. That's the cognitive appraisal, you, the uncertainty, which leads to that emotional state. But those cognitive appraisals also emanate from that. So there's, there's this literature, whether you're looking at cognitive appraisals proceeding from the emotion or antecedent to the emotion. Right, but we focus on proceeding, but it, uh, sorry, antecedent, but uh, proceeding. But in this, it is not relevant because the downstream variable that we're looking at is it only consumption, which the best, most efficient predictor is the pleasantness of the emotion, and that's what we're looking at. So yes, in certain certain situations, certain contexts, getting a more nuanced understanding of emotions would be more relevant. But in this particular context, that, form, that overall positive versus negative emotion is enough to give you the description. Yeah? So what can be the explanation of why women are more affected by affect and, and why they express this affective state more intensely in consumption? There's actually um, neurological evidence, so not in marketing literature, but mm -hmm. in uh, biological sciences and uh, other, some psychology literature as well which has looked at fMRI maps, there is some neurological uh, evidence to suggest that the areas of the brain that light up with say let's say response to disgusting picture that paper that Rod was citing earlier, they actually have an fMRI study and females have a larger reaction, larger activation of different parts in the brain to those stimuli versus men. So why we do that is biological. How we do that, as we discussed, is also culturally learned, right? How you respond to those same experiences, as well as here we are looking at that. So we are looking at sort of a mediator of a mediator, right? So yes, the biology dictates your extreme response. Once you have that response, there is some cultural element on how you are responding to that experience. So women across cultures will respond more emotionally let's say, or have more of a, of, or a higher response to weather changes in affect, but they might not express them similarly. A lot more questions than <laughs> we got to ask you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so uh, much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Again for us in this short visit. Thank you so much. This is a work in progress, so it's very helpful to get the feedback. Yeah, all the comments. And if you have any other questions, we'd be very happy to answer and uh, that might help us as well in addressing the review of comments. Thank you. All the best for the paper. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, hopefully, they like the revisions. Yeah. So we did three more strategies, so hopefully. Still have the work now, so we'll have the song.